Whenever I talk about reactions of alkyl halides, I'm always kind of tripping over my words because the reagent used can act as either a nucleophile, a Lewis base, or a Bronsted base. And what it does depends on the reaction conditions and the structure of the alkyl halide. This speaks to a fundamental competition between nucleophilic substitution and elimination when an alkyl halide is combined with some nucleophilic or, or basic reagent. Basically something with a lone pair of electrons that can go for either the carbon attached to the halogen or a proton at a, at a beta carbon leading to elimination. So substitution and elimination compete with one another and one thing we want to be able to do and what we'll learn in this video is how to predict the major pathway when a given alkyl halide is combined with given uh, reagents, given reaction conditions. So in many cases, one reaction pathway, substitution or elimination, will predominate and it'll either be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. But you do want to think flexibly here because nature adores mixtures, right? From an entropic point of view, a mixture of substitution and elimination is not unexpected. However, we're going to try to think rationally about this and predict the major pathway based on what we've learned already about the tendency of nucleophilic substitution versus elimination to occur and when SN2 versus SN1 occurs and E1 versus E2, for example. So to predict the outcome of a given reaction with a nucleophile or base, we're going to ask three questions essentially. First, we're going to determine the function of the nucleophilic or basic reagent. Is it strong or weak? Is it an anionic uh, species or a neutral species? Is it sterically bulky or is it unhindered? This will give us a sense of whether we'll tend to be in the sort of SN2E2 world with strong nucleophiles, strong bases, or the SN1E1 world with weak nucleophiles, weak bases, and bulky versus unhindered gives us a sense of elimination versus substitution with bulky nucleophiles or bases tending to engage in elimination and unhindered nucleophiles or bases tending to act as uh, nucleophiles in substitution reactions. Then we're going to look at the alkyl halide particularly its substitution pattern. What mechanism ex is expected based on that substitution pattern? Are we in an unhindered situation where SN2 can occur or a hindered situation where we'd have to do SN1 or can do E2 or E1 potentially? And then after the second question, we'll have a sense of the most likely mechanism that occurs. And at this point, we'll want to think carefully about the regiochemistry and stereochemistry of the reaction. How will the reaction actually take place? Will carbocation rearrangements be involved? We might want to start pushing some curved arrows. And when it comes to stereochemistry, here we're thinking about, is the reaction stereospecific? Should I expect a mixture of stereoisomers or a single stereoisomer of product based on how the mechanism occurs? And throughout this whole problem solving process, staying flexible is really important. It's easy when you're first starting out to go down an incorrect line of thought, right? I wouldn't expect to get this right on the first try every single time when you first learn about substitution and elimination. So stay flexible, don't be afraid to back up once you've realized, okay, something's off, for example, if you start drawing the final product and realize, okay, something's off here, back up, think carefully, return to these three questions, and reevaluate. So the first question we ask ourselves is about the function of the nucleophilic or basic reagent. Will it act as a nucleophile predominantly or predominantly as a base? And this comes down to nucleophilicity versus basicity on some level. Nucleophilicity is a kinetic phenomenon. How quickly does that species donate a pair of electrons, add or to or attack an electrophile? And nucleophilicity is increased with high electron density and high polarizability. So something like SH- with a very large sulfur atom is more polarizable and actually more nucleophilic than the much, much smaller smaller H- anion. Basicity, on the other hand, is fundamentally thermodynamic. In essence, what's the pKa of the conjugate acid gives you a sense of, the, of basicity. And in, in terms of stability, in sort of qualitative terms, how stable is the base relative to the conjugate base of the acid that we're trying to deprotonate? So basicity comes down to a high value of Kb, or a low Ka for the conjugate acid 
unstable negative charge or an electron pair also leads to high basicity. And this is sort of the qualitative structural stability factors idea. Now, on some level, nucleophilicity and basicity go hand in hand. For example, if we're comparing neutral molecules to anions, well, the anions would be expected to be both better nucleophiles and stronger bases than the corresponding neutral molecules. However, there are cases where nucleophilicity and basicity are inversely related. We see in the middle of this slide a table that lists four different categories of species based on their basicity and nucleophilicity. The kind of normal ones are the second and fourth, strong bases and strong nucleophiles. Things like alkoxide and hydroxide anions are both good bases and good nucleophiles. In the fourth box, we have weak bases and weak nucleophiles. And these are things like neutral alcohols, water, and other neutral molecules that are not very basic because they're neutral, and they're also weak nucleophiles. The interesting boxes are the second, uh, are the first and the third, rather, where we have strong bases that are weak nucleophiles and weak bases that are strong nucleophiles. And so I wanted to take a bit to talk about these. Strong bases that are weak nucleophiles will tend to do elimination, since they're, they're weak nucleophiles, right? They tend not to attack, say, carbocations or electrophilic carbons bearing alkyl halides, but they're strong bases. And so they'll deprotonate at a beta carbon easily uh, and with great facility, but will not engage in substitution. And these are things like sodium hydride. It's a poor nucleophile because of its very low polarizability. And so this will tend to promote eliminations. These two bases, DBN and DBU, are worth keeping in mind. These are nitrogen-centered bases with lone pairs on nitrogen that tend to be weak nucleophiles because of steric bulk around the um, basic, basic atom. These carbons in the vicinity of the basic nitrogen um, tend to shield this uh, species from acting as a nucleophile. So DBN and DBU, structurally very similar. The basic atom in both cases is this nitrogen, and you can rationalize that by protonating there and seeing what happens. We get a resonant stabilized conjugate acid. So these are weak nucleophiles, but good bases. Great if you want elimination to take place. Weak bases that are strong nucleophiles are things that are very stable thermodynamically with negative charge, but that have high polarizability. Things like I minus, Br minus, and Cl minus, these halide anions that we know to be terrible, terrible Bronsted bases, but react quickly as nucleophiles because of their high polarizability. SH minus and Sr minus are the same. And even neutral sulfur compounds, RSH, H2S, and R2S are strong nucleophiles as well due to the high polarizability of sulfur. So these will tend to engage in substitution selectively. Even these anionic species that we might expect to be able to act as bases will tend to selectively act as nucleophiles and engage in, for example, SN2 reactions. This table is sort of the centerpiece of determining the mechanism when an alkyl halide reacts with a nucleophilic or basic reagent. It's got two dimensions along the rows and columns. Along the uh, columns, we have these four dimensions that we looked at on the previous slide, basicity and nucleophilicity. And there are four possible combinations, strong base, weak nucleophile, strong base, strong nucleophile, weak base, strong nucleophile, and weak base, weak nucleophile. Along the rows, we have the three different possible substitution patterns for the alkyl halide. And actually, methyl is, is left off of here. Methyl can engage only in SN2. Let's actually add that to the slide so that we're aware of that. Methyl substrates can only react in SN2 reactions, or not at all, in the case of, for example, a very weak base and very weak nucleophile. We've got primary, secondary, and tertiary alkyl halide possibilities as well. And one thing we can notice, for instance, is that within this sort of strong category, we develop a preference for E2 elimination as the substitution increases around the electrophilic carbon. This is because SN2 gets slower, and we've seen that previously, and the reagent we're using is a strong base, and so it can still deprotonate even if the alkyl halide is highly substituted, and we end up with a preference for E2 elimination. Over on the weak side, 
With a strong nucleophile, we're going to do SN2, assuming that the alkyl halide is unhindered, primary and secondary cases. But for a hindered tertiary alkyl halide, only SN1 is possible. And so even for strong nucleophiles, SN1 is the norm here, with the leaving group leaving and then the nucleophile coming in due to steric hindrance in the starting alkyl halide. For a weak base and weak nucleophile, only tertiary alkyl halides can support enough uh, tertiary carbocations for reaction to occur at all. Primary and secondary substrates will react at very slow rates with weak bases and weak nucleophiles. For the tertiary case, though, we can get an appreciable concentration of, of carbocations, essentially enough carbocations that either SN1 or E1 can take place. And here, things like the reaction temperature become imper imperative um, to look at to predict SN1 versus E1, and actually predictions can be difficult. And so, for example, for secondary substrates with a strong base or strong nucleophile, E2 tends to predominate, that's entropy in action, but SN2 will occur to a significant degree. Similarly, with tertiary substrates, SN1 and E1 can be very difficult to predict. This depends on the reaction temperature predominantly. Primary substrates, and we noted this earlier, tend to do SN2 with strong nucleophiles, but we'll see a small amount of competing E2 in these reactions as well. To sum up here, what I'll say is you should be able to rationalize in words the outcome in each box and explain to yourself and to others why each mechanism occurs in each box. And if it helps, draw an example of an alkyl halide in each case and draw an example of each of these categories of bases slash nucleophiles to help put a concrete spin on each of these possibilities. This slide summarizes important regiochemical and stereochemical concerns for the four possible possible mechanisms. I won't go through them in detail. All I'll say is that once you've determined the expected mechanism, this is answering essentially that second question after you've considered both the nucleophile, which tells you the column you're in, and the alkyl halide, which tells you the row you're, you're in, it is important to consider regiochemistry and stereochemistry. For example, in the SN2 reaction, the nucleophile attacks the carbon linked to the leaving group. That's pretty straightforward. But we have this inversion of configuration that makes the reaction stereospecific. And we'll want to take that into account when actually drawing the product. So make sure that you consider, for example, regioselectivity, whether a carbocation rearrangement will occur, whether we'll get the more or less substituted double bond, the Zaitsev or Hoffman product in these eliminations. And then stereochemically, do I expect a racemic mixture? Do I expect a single enantiomer of product? Do I expect a mixture of diastereomers, perhaps? These are things worth considering in the stereochemical realm and are going to affect how you draw the product. Let's put our knowledge to the test now and predict the major and minor products expected in each of the following reactions, which could now do nucleophilic substitution or elimination. So now we have no indication of which reaction or re which reaction mechanism is going on, but we're going to follow our three-step process for determining the major reaction pathway here, considering the nucleophile, the alkyl halide, and then regiochemistry and stereochemistry. All right, in this first reaction, the first thing I noticed is that the alkyl halide is primary. So E1, SN1, not even thinking about those, right? Since a carbocation at that primary carbon is completely unreasonable to propose, unreasonably unstable. We've got SH minus in the reagents. This is a good nucleophile and a poor base. So it fits into this column in our 4 by 4 table where we have a weak base but a strong nucleophile. So now I've actually narrowed down the mechanism to SN2. In fact, I'm living in this cell of the table. So we've got an SN2 mechanism, and this is supported by the polar aprotic solvent used, DMF, dimethylformamide, which is going to accelerate the reaction. So we've got SN2, and to draw that product, I'm simply going to replace the leaving group, I minus, with the nucleophile, SH minus, and we end up with this product, which is butane thiol. Notice this new carbon-sulfur bond was made from a pair of electrons in SH minus. 
All right. In the second case, I have a secondary alkyl halide, the dreaded secondary alkyl halide, which has the possibility of substitution or elimination, depending primarily on the nature of the nucleophile slash base. So our reagent here is NaOME, Na plus, OME minus. OME minus is a strong base and a good nucleophile. So we've got the possibility of either E2 or SN2 taking place. And typically, with strong bases like this and secondary substrates, E2 elimination is going to dominate. And we'll have a little bit of SN2 product as the minor product. In addition, we have a regiochemical issue here. Elimination could occur at this beta carbon to produce a monosubstituted alkene, or elimination could occur at this carbon to produce a disubstituted alkene. And we know with unhindered bases like this, methoxide is a relatively small anion, the Zaitsev product is expected. So we're going to deprotonate at this carbon highlighted in orange, and we'll get the trans product as the major product. We're eliminating at a CH2, so cis and trans isomers are possible, but the trans isomer will be the major product, and we'll have as a minor product a little bit of SN2 substitution. Notice that the methoxy group is on the opposite side of the electrophilic carbon from where the leaving group was. This is a manifestation of inversion of configuration right here. But the major product unquestionably will be the transalkene disubstituted because the Zaitsev product is going to form with this relatively unhindered base. Okay, what about the, about the last case? Well, we again have a secondary alkyl halide. We've got a good nucleophile but poor base in the chloride anion. Good nucleophile because of its polarizability, poor base because it's chloride, the conjugate base of HCl, a strong acid. So substitution is going to occur, and with a secondary substrate that can't really support a terribly stable carbocation, we end up with SN2 substitution. This is also supported by the use of a polar aprotic solvent, TMSO, which will accelerate SN2 relative to SN1. So the SN2 mechanism will take place, and the big thing here is to make sure we account for inversion of configuration, drawing the carbon chlorine bond on the opposite side from where the carbon bromine bond was in the original substrate. So again, just to summarize here, we followed this three-step process for determining the major reaction pathway and reaction mechanism when an alkyl halide is treated with a nucleophile slash base. Determining the function of the nucleophilic or basic reagent, is it a nucleophile or base, and is it strong or weak along both of those dimensions? Then we analyze the alkyl halide, what's its substitution pattern, and what mechanism is expected, essentially based on this table, keeping in mind that mixtures are quite common, particularly in these three circumstances with secondary substrates, primary substrates, and uh, tertiary substrates uh, with a weak base or, or nucleophile. And then we thought about regiochemistry and stereochemistry, making sure that we drew a product with the proper connectivity and stereochemical um, configurations based on the mechanism and its particular quirks like stereospecificity, Zaitsev versus Hoffman, and things like this.